there is a, a, a sort of a trend of tattooing that's sort of emerged that I, I kind of can't understand. If you can nail it every time, you're not learning anything. The people that are selling tattooing now or doing tattoos and even getting tattoos if they did back then, they only got fucking eaten alive. That's all journey, you know. My name is Steph Bastian. In my 10 years on the road, I've met many unique characters in the tattoo business, and they all have one thing in common, incredible stories. Stories of past times, personal growth, priceless experience, and of course, bizarre happenings. I want to share those stories with you. This is Tattoo Tales. Good day, everybody. Today I'm in Auckland, New Zealand with Dean, owner of Sacred Tattoo. Dean is possibly one of the finest tattooers that New Zealand ever produced, and he influenced a whole generation of people with his large-scale Japanese pieces and brought custom tattooing to a whole another level through the years. It's been a pleasure to talk with him about ethics, techniques, experience, and Nicolas Cage. <laughs> and uh, I want to share with you his wisdom, uh, but especially his humbleness, which is a trait that I found in the biggest people that I met throughout my career. So it was an absolute pleasure to meet him again and uh, have a chat. I hope you enjoy. So Dean, welcome. Thanks. How long have you been tattooing, Dean? Um, last year was my 25th year. Okay. Tattooing. Yeah. And you from? From West Auckland, New Zealand. So born and raised here? Born and raised here, yeah. And how did yeah. you get into it? Um, I've always been into art. My dad's an artist and just grew up drawing and painting with him from an early age. Um, and then from there, just being influenced by art and what was happening within the different cultures that I was sort of immersed in, if you know what I mean, like skateboarding and punk, mm. punk music, hardcore metal. It's funny yeah. how most of the people. Well, yeah, I, I think a lot of people from my generation that are in tattooing are, are very influenced by those same cultures. You know, I like the imagery that comes from those sort of different lifestyles. You know, it's uh, it's it's something that I don't think is going to be re recreated. And how was the scene in those days? Down here, pretty quiet, really. Um, there was a scene, but New Zealand's small, the population's small, so the scene's going to be small. You know, it's, it was hard to get to know and see anything when it comes to 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 music and it was just as hard to, to get and see and be influenced by anything that was happening overseas in relation to tattooing as well purely because of the only thing you had was magazines and if that was if somebody or some some news agent was selling them you know mm. it was really hard to to get reference so i think a lot of people relied on creating their own styles, you know, from the experience, I mean, from the um, reference that they could get their hands on. So you, you've got a lot of originality, which is, again, totally different from today. Yeah, because yeah. now, obviously, obviously the level is higher technically and stuff, but because yeah. everybody look at the same reference and even the same people, yeah. then the, everything gets watered down towards uh, an homologation of style. So... Lots yeah. of things look very much alike. Yeah, you, you can see what people are doing instantly now. So um, I think tattooing has become a very trend-based sort of uh, culture, you know. You'll, someone will be doing something that's really innovative and then there'll be a lot of people doing that after that because, you know, obviously they're getting influenced and they're seeing exactly what they're doing straight away. And personally, I think that's probably one of the problems that we have in tattooing these days is that there's a, it's like a really small percentage of innovators but a gigantic sort of wave of imitated, you know what I mean? And I think, I'm not saying that people that are inspired and, and really sort of recreating styles over and over again are, are bad tattooers. They're just, um, I just kind of really, I'm, these days I'm really looking for originality in, in people, you know what I mean? Who, and I found that you got, you got that back 20, 25 years ago, a lot yeah. more. Who comes in your mind when you think about, if I tell you, okay, originality in tattooing, who comes in your mind, like, as a name? Or, oh, like, there's, so people, many, there's so many. Um, you're like, oh, yeah, these well, these days or so back, in the, back in the day? Either or. Well, you know, there's, there's different aspects to it, I think. I think, you know, when you think about people like um, Philip Lou, 
he, he was doing um, his version of Japanese, but it was not a lot of people were doing what he was doing back then, you know? Um, when you think of like, um, like Alex Binney, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. just, just the paths that they were going in. When you, when you think about the biomechanics and, and stuff like that and the tribal that were popping up back then with Leo Silverweta and um, Guy Aitchison, you know, Marcus Pacheco, mm-hmm. they were all sort of pushing the boundaries and doing these cool things. Which you don't really see these days, you know. These days you see people doing cool shit like, you know, like uh, Water Street Phantom, you know, doing some mm-hmm. crazy cool stuff. And, mm-hmm. and um, that's the sort of stuff I like looking at. It's just hard to find, you know. And these days really you're looking and trying to find it on Instagram, you know, on social media. And I'm sort of slowly getting further and further away from that. You can see right away where the references come from, like mm, because totally. because I travel so much, then I get to experience different people' methods of work, yeah. and then I actually go to their shop or their house, and I see I spend time with them, and I see how they do things. Yeah. And you can tell the when you're like, okay, I know that this guy or this girl yeah. is very original, is very innovative and stuff, and then you can see why because you go to their place and you, and you see the books, and you're like, ah, okay, I see where this comes from. Yeah, and then this person was like has books and studies. Uh, ornamental fabric in Persia or whatever mm. and then you get their patterns that's why they're they're always like two steps ahead of everybody else because yeah. they don't look at what they're not looking at other tattoos they're looking at yeah. the core reference yeah yeah. so who, who do you think who, who, who do you think Original, been, originality yeah. wise um, for example in the young people young younger yeah yeah I see people that do things uh, for example, like I think about Tony from Blue Arms from Oslo, which he mm. does traditional, which is very bad green, but he has his very his own twist. Yeah. Then, like you mentioned, Stace, yeah, uh, Water Street Phantom. He actually, you know, is very, it's very different, kind of like yokai, kind of yeah. like uh, manga Akira. It's, it's cool kind of because thing. it's so it is so twisted, but you can still see where it's coming from. You know, Mm-mm-mm. you have a. Yeah, I might think about. There's a friend of mine, Michael Rasetti, which he does Japanese, and he's very. I think maybe Kuriyoshi inspired, but mm. it's different a little bit. So it's very solid, but you can tell that it's, it's different. It has the tattoo touch to it, but with the very fine eye for design, you know, and it's like, okay, that is very, it's, it's fresh. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely got to sit and think about it, you know, mm. but there are a few that, that, that push yeah. that thing that, has been done the way it's supposed to be done, but with a little something. Yeah, yeah. You know, for example, like a friend of mine, Ron Kupal, he said uh, once about grads. Yeah. From Kings Avenue, and yeah, he was yeah. like, "Yeah, this beautiful expression with the love." He's like, "Yeah, his tattoos are tough and elegant." It's like, yes, mm-hmm. you know, it's traditional, but you can tell that it's him. So yeah. it's a, it's a signature. You're like, oh, right away you you identify that person because it's not yeah lost in a sea of a like you say of a hundred imitators. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. I'm learning a little bit about the New Zealand mm-hmm. history and stuff. For example, Merv O'Connor and yep. who were the 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 main influences? Yeah, pioneers or or. Um, there's there's been a lot of you know there's been a lot of older tattooers. A, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of them are passing on now. Mm. You get into that, it's getting to that sort of that point in that generation. But you know, when you think about Roger Ingleton and and Steve Johnson, Roger Ingleton was in Wellington. And um, I think he was quite an original kind of character for New Zealand because he was a tattooer and he was actually a fine artist as well. And back, I think, when he was doing what he was doing, those types of worlds didn't really collide that often, you know. Um, uh, Steve Johnson, just a um, fucking balls to the wall, Christchurch, South Island tattooer, you know, just large bodies of work, you know. Um, like Obviously, big scales or big scale Japanese, you know, in his in his style, you know, there's there's a definite. You see a Steve Johnson tattoo, you know, you know about you know about it, you know what I mean. Same with um, same with Roger Ingleton, you know, you, you you can you can definitely see these styles a mile away. You can, they're very very specific. Um, in Auckland, people that were influential, um, I think, you know, there were obviously only a handful of tattoos. You know, when we, back when I started, there was you pretty much could count everybody, you know, on a couple of hands. Um, but, you know, I think College Hill was a shop that was really doing the type of tattooing that I was was sort of psyched on when I was a kid. You know, it was just kind of like dudes doing um, 
tribal and sort of like a, a little bit more of a, of a punk sort of edge to it. Do you know what I mean? Like rough and, and, and Not strong. So, yeah, yeah, strong. Strong, strong. Yeah. But again, you know, that was, it was, they were bikers, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't the same kind of, wasn't the same kind of lifestyle that I was, I was used to. But um, yeah, I think, you know, the, obviously there was Merv, but Merv again was another generation ahead of everyone else. He was the old guy, you know, super cool. Did you ever meet me? So it was, no. Yeah. I saw his shop in uh, Ponzambi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's cool that the shop's still going and everything, and, and Merv was definitely a huge part of Because it passed recently, kind of recently, right? A couple of years ago, couple yeah, years ago. yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, if, it would have been awesome if you had a, had a chance to talk to him, because he'll sit, you sit down and, you know, the stories are amazing. But, um, yeah, you know, obviously, um, Steve Marching, if you ever get a chance to talk to him, you should, mm -hmm. because he's... He's definitely an Auckland icon. Um, you, know, you know, people were doing cool shit. Even like uh, Paula Solete, he was, before he died, you know, he was traveling quite a lot, going to Europe and stuff. But he was definitely connecting styles and, and sort of bridging certain cultures. He was this like traditional there, you know, Samoan tattooing. He actually tattooed a friend of mine. And he tattooed a friend of mine because this guy specifically had quite a lot of work from Roger Ingleton in Wellington, mm -hmm. and um, my my friend um, Andrew, he's like a Palangi. He's a he's a white guy, you know. And um, how did you call it? Palangi. Palangi means yeah. a white guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, and I, I, when he was getting his pair, or when he was trying to get a pair, he I don't think he was. It was that common for um, much like a, a European Kiwi guy to get to get that kind of work. So because Andrew had tattooing from Roger Ingleton. Paula was like, man, I want to, I want to tattoo next to that. So he has this um, really, really cool mashup of Roger Ingleton tribal and Paula Solepi um, pair, and it's fucking pretty cool. You know, obviously he's he's changing it and making things work a little more over the years, but um, uh, but it was cool to see that that combination and that clash of styles purely because Paula wanted to, you know, put his work next to somebody like Roger Ingleton, which is, I think. A really interesting point of view from a from a cultural sort of side of tattooing. Apart from that, there's um there's so many characters uh, with Auckland tattooing, and around the time that I was sort of starting tattooing, one of the main influences for me when I was a lot younger was this guy called Phil Carney, and um, Phil Carney was pretty much hanging around the um, the studio that I started working on and you know, working in, you know, where I got my apprenticeship. And he was sort of a bit of a lost soul, kind of uh, rough around the edges kind of guy. Troubled with drug addiction and stuff like that. So it was, it, it all kind of created this image, you know. And um, Like bohemian kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. He, um, he lived his life like an outlaw, like an outlaw Josie Wales type thing. He was an amazing tattooer. Man. Yeah, I just learned a lot from watching how he tattooed and sort of his approach not so much how he created a tattoo, but just the um, how it all came together. You know, he had a very, very strange style. He was doing a lot of large scale kind of scenes and full color portraits in like 25 years ago. And it was just amazing, you know, this is like stuff that you wouldn't expect. Now, nowadays it's kind of like, oh yeah, it's just another one of those things. But back then it was like, man, that's incredible. And a lot of these things he was doing, he was drawing on, you know, if you draw on a a picture of somebody of a you know like a famous person or a, somebody that's passed away and he nails it just from drawing that is mind blowing because especially today with the you know ipad ebook e-printer yeah blah, blah, nothing, blah, like, blah. That. <laughs> nothing <laughs> like that yeah <laughs> that's why i was kind of like oh this is the guy you know and he's he gave up tattooing he's kind of i don't i just don't think he liked having to deal with people it sounds very much along the lines of his personality, like you said. Totally, man. You know, super nice guy, you know, and I, I'd love to track him down and just give him a whole lot of tattoo equipment and say, man, just give it another go. But You um, lost touch? Pretty much, yeah. Um, every now and then he would pop up, but I haven't seen or heard from him for a long time. I'd love to, I'd love to bump into him. Yeah, I think he lives, he's living in Tauranga now, so I never get down there. I don't think he comes up here that often. He was a big influence. But um, apart from, you know, people that I just, I, I just sort of was working with, Back then, we kind of were just uh, sort of learning off each other and just encouraging and sort of just trying to get through it, you know. Did you have a lot of stuff coming from the States or Europe over like magazines and stuff? Do you have a... Well, like it's influence-wise? Hmm. 
yeah, magazines was the only thing. You know, there wasn't a lot of influence apart from that. Every now and then there would be a tattoo show that would come down and you'd see something and you'd be like, whoa, what the, you know, what the hell? You know, when with another um, tattooer, it was a Tamako tattooer that was in Greyland for a while, he, um, he would have a lot of um, Europeans and sometimes Americans come down and do guest spots in the shop. Have you, have you heard of Inya? Where? Inya Taylor. No. He had Moko Inc. for a while there. What's his name? Inya. Inya, no. Yeah. And um, you'd sort of catch a few of the people that he would have come in through his shop and some of them would be like, you know, some of the work they would have is just like, whoa, what the, what the fuck? That's amazing. You know? I guess maybe some people would come and visit maybe Suluak as well. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because of his connection. That was a little later. You know, like people would come and, you know, Inya and so, uh, Polo and, and a lady that was working with Inya, Pip Russell, put on a, an early Auckland tattoo show. Not long, Actually, not long after that tattoo show it was, the, was the time that Polo actually died. When was got, that? Like, kind of. I think that would have been early to mid 90s because of Polo's influence and probably Inya's influences at that point as well. A lot of people were coming down, kind of making it a bit of a working holiday, you know what I mean? Um, not a lot of people were, were doing that before that, but gave people an opportunity to come here. And these days, it's a different story, you know? Like and it's with, cheaper. I yeah. guess before was, way, it's already expensive to come here, but I guess oh, yeah. like 20 years ago. Yeah, we're down here at the bottom of the world, man. Yeah, yeah. And 20 years ago, yeah, it wasn't it's really on the, it wasn't on the radar for a lot of people. Um, but it was cool seeing those uh, people that did come down here, seeing what they had and what they did and stuff like that. Would you get influence slash influence like a mutual or something with Australia or not? Oh, of course. There's so many amazing tattooers in Australia. Okay, some of the some of the early uh, influences were Geordie Cole. He's probably not. He probably hasn't been telling much longer than that. He's an huh? animal. Yeah, yeah. He's, he does cool shit. Um, obviously, Trevor McStay. And there's a lot of other tattooers all over Australia that are doing amazing stuff. What's his name? Like, he's on the West Coast in Perth. Was he a Ricky Luther? Ricky Luther? Yeah. That's another old time in there. Yeah, there's, a, there's so many, man. There's so many. Because my, my memory is, I can't just pull these names off the top of my head, but I wish I could. But, um, you know, we used to get this magazine called uh, Outlaw Biker Magazine. And I think they did a, a tattoo version of that. I think it was just called Tattoo, Australian Tattoo or something like that. And you, you'd see a bit of that. You know, there'd be a cross-reference cross of everything, you know, from a biker show to a, to a tattoo show. Some of the tattooing was amazing. Because we were more likely to get, a, to get an Australian sort of biker tattoo magazine than we would uh, American. Like American. Yeah. yeah. It's so strange. Probably people that have only been tattooing for in the last 10 years not to think that there wasn't any other way of seeing things. We were saying that it's so cool that when you had the magazines, the cool thing was that you had once a month. Yeah. So and you were waiting there like a Bible. Yeah. And then when it, because you would have nothing else, so you would read that magazine a million times. Totally. So by the end, you would know that picture and that tattoo. I've got scrapbooks of little pictures. To the pictures. centimeter. You know, there'd be, there'd be yeah. magazines that are like, oh, most, I'd say 90% of the magazine, I didn't, but there'd be that 10% that I was like, oh. God, and you studied that tattoo a million times. Yeah, I cut it out and put it in a scrapbook. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I just sort of like that is what I that's that's kind of my that was my inspiration. My it kind of just kept me going. You and uh, you basically brought contributed to bring custom tattooing here to another level. And how do you how's your experience with that? Like, because when you started, it was more, I guess. Flash based? Or? Well, when I, I never started in a shop that had flash, you know what I mean? We always sort of tried to focus on just really creating an image for the individual. I mean, people will come in with their reference and people come in exactly with what exactly they want. You know, they'll say, this is what I want, reproduce that, put it on me. And we'd do that. We'd do anything that people want, wanted. But we would also draw a lot and try and encourage something a little bit more original, something a little bit more them, something a little bit more us. But um, that whole custom thing didn't really start until we opened um, Sacred in the early 90s. And that's where we sort of just had a little private studio and we didn't really have any signs saying tattooing and you didn't know we were there unless you knew we were there. Which is kind of like, I don't know, it makes things hard, makes life hard because you, you're not getting a lot of work. You don't have to walk in. Do you? Yeah, yeah. But um, the work you do is exactly what you wanted to do. Was it in the same location? No, it was in um, Simon Street, which is up in, in the city a little more, and a little upstairs above a, 
a group of shots upstairs. So when did you move here? Tucked away. We moved here six years ago, and before here we were on K Road. Hmm. Yeah. How was K Road? Because that must be like quite the opposite, like chaotic a bit, no? K Road's, you know, depends on the day on K Road. You know what I mean? It's like, um, I liked K Road because it was right there. There's a lot of people, you know, there's a, always something going on. Definitely um, colourful. Colourful, yeah, it's pretty rad. Yeah, like, but, you know, when, I get to a, when you get to a certain age and you start having kids and your kids are coming into work and you're bringing your kids in, you know what I mean, stuff like that, you're coming in on a, on a Friday, morn, uh, Friday um, Saturday morning and there's someone passed out in your doorway or someone's, <laughs> someone's used it as a place to puke or urinate, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. kind of like, ah, this isn't as cool as, as it seems, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um... That's just how it is on Cairo. It's just you take the good with the bad. But um, obviously there's a lot of people doing it hard and there is a, some people, or well, quite a lot of people that are homeless. But when you go to somewhere like LA and you go down Skid Row and you see what's going on there, it's a fucking high man. man. It's crazy. There isn't really a lot of support for people that are, are doing it hard, which is a shame. Yeah. Have you been down there? In LA? Yeah. Just passing by years ago, yeah. like three days. Did you go downtown? It's a different... So the thing you do the most is custom Japanese. Yeah, the yeah. most. I, I'm happy to do anything, mm. but I do do a lot of that. You know, mm. I like drawing it. I like looking at it. I like tattooing it. I like the way it looks on the skin. I like what, how it looks large scale. I like how all those elements come together and create a, a finished piece. How did you fall in love with Japanese? When I first started tattooing, tattooing, I yeah. didn't like it at all. I was like, the fuck are they drawing a dragon like that? You know, it's just like, look at the hands on that thing, you know, or look at the claws. I'm like... Coming from a, like a, a comic book sort of 2000 AD and some of the almost fantasy type, type of influences, um, I was kind of like, man, it's just, I just couldn't get down with that style. Gradually, as I understood, because, you know, I didn't understand shit. I was, you know, as I understood tattooing and I understood the, the, the history and what, what they used to create these things and where they referenced these images from to, you know, to create these masterpieces, I, I understood you know, the more you look into it, the more you reference and the more you understand and, and get to love and want to create what makes that look so fucking good, you know? Um, and seriously, I only, I only really started really understanding it. I actually don't really understand it now. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to do it. I only realized that gradually. It's, I never sort of went, fuck, that's for me. Kind of grows on you. Yeah, because I was doing everything and because I was sort of, in the same day, you'd do like a sort of a graph piece and then you'd do a, a portrait and then maybe you'd do some Japanese. So, you know, it's kind of just thrown in the mix of everything. It's just probably like everybody back then, you know. I only kind of got to the point where I was drawing that a lot that I um, sort of started to really enjoy tattooing it and really pushing towards tattooing that a lot more. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, you look back at what you've drawn and what you've tattooed 10, 15, maybe even five years ago, and it's things evolve so so quickly, you know. How would you say that your style evolved, like changed, or the way you see or, or approach or interpret things change? Like yeah. now and, and, I suppose and it's really how how my um, my influence has progressed, um, and you know what who what's been influencing me, what I've been looking at, and obviously back 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 when I first really starting into it, I was really looking at. Philip Lou and, and Mick and stuff like that, you know, and, and really being influenced by that more illustrated, sort of large-scale flowing Japanese, you know. Um, these days, I just love fucking Horiyoshi second, man. I can't really put, put my finger on it. Everything that, that is, um, everything I see, I love. You know, even stuff that I think still looks a little off, it looks f- fucking red because I mean, it is. In the right kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I don't know. You know, like obviously you have a lot of Japanese influences on what you do. Is there anything? In some stuff, you know. Yeah, in some stuff. Much, but you um, you know, because obviously you do a lot of different sort of images within your style, and influenced by different different things, right? Yeah. Is there anything? Is there any person or anything? Any any artist that you that inspires you when it comes to Japanese Uh, specifically? Like like you say, you know, at first you start looking at tattooers when you don't know enough of Japanese because yeah, yeah. you don't know enough to know where that comes from you yeah. don't know enough to know you know the history of wood blocks you don't know mm. enough to so you look at, at obviously tattoo artists from magazine and then the internet comes along yeah. you know 
and then you start learning and then you realize oh that's where that comes from you know yeah. because you talk to other tattooers and they tell you oh this is guy's okusai and you're like who the fuck yeah. is okusai you know and then you get into it and i find myself now it's funny because uh i look at a lot of wood blocks not necessarily just for the japanese inspired pieces but even for other things yeah for example like i'm doing now i'm working on the book that i was telling you about mm-hmm. and it's a uh, traditional back pieces but i still look at some wood blocks because mm-hmm. now what really resonates with me is the design mm-hmm. you know and it's yeah. not necessarily the subject or the brush strokes or, but it's the design the composition yeah. and the simplicity like oh you know what there is a rhythm, there is a flowing within this piece that goes, it's like a symphony, you know, so it goes from busy mm-hmm. to this area of one flat color. Yeah. And then you balance it out. And you're like, oh, that's fucking awesome. And then you can translate it in many yeah. other styles, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that now, the thing that I look and I like the most in Japanese is this older wood blocks, like, yeah, Edo time, you know? Mm-hmm. I found this guy, what was he called? Oh, so bad with names, man. It will come to me anyway. Yeah. But they're more graphic. And it's funny because, like you say, I guess maybe you went through or you go through something similar, that the more time goes by, or at least that's my process that I know within myself, and it's a process of elimination. Yeah. So you start with a lot. I started doing photorealism. Portraits. Really? <laughs> yeah. And then from that, because I tried it all, because obviously yeah. street shops oh, go totally. through the whole thing, and yeah, I've man. always been curious. So I went from photorealism to new school yeah to new traditional yeah to traditional so it's yeah. almost like you're like stripping out of the stuff that you don't need and now totally. i really appreciate this style because it's really i think the more you essential yeah the more you get into the core reasons you like tattooing or what what influences you that becomes more and more basic you know what i mean you're taking mm-hmm. out everything you don't need you understand what creates the image you want to create and usually that thing is the simplest aspect to it, you know. I find that um, with Japanese, what makes me attracted to it is the flow and the consistency of the background and the flow and the consistency of the style within the background. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And without that, you don't have that that magic. The power. It has to have that, ma- yeah, that background, that power, the flow, the style. And when it all comes together, that consistency creates that masterpiece. But... Again, I was saying I'm, st- I'm still learning. I don't, I don't know shit. Yeah, I think that the moment that you're like, oh, I learned everything, it's time to stop. I think, <laughs> I think people that think no, they know You'll everything. never get to that point. Uh, yeah. No less than people that know they don't know everything. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of it's something that you should always be learning. It's, it's a journey, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's important to keep it in mind. To, yeah. To, to keep in mind and appreciate the journey. You know, yeah. the fact that... Totally. If eventually, which won't happen, but yeah. if one day you will have all of the knowledge, you know, you'll be blessed with some <laughs> su- some enlightenment. Yeah, the fun is done. The fun is over. You know, yeah. what I mean? the fun is like to figure out. And then when you when you, something click, which I guess that the more time goes by, when you start, there's a curve of uh, learning, which I can remember, like a psychologist, Russian dude, made a study on. You know, and then when you start, you learn this much. Yeah, and then you know, the more you learn, then your increases will become more and more minimal. You know. Yeah. So now there's like minimal increases, but when something clicks, and yeah, you can yeah. tell, that I see this year after year, you yeah, know, because yeah. I was thinking about yesterday, I was doing a tattoo, and then I can't remember what I was doing, and I was like, oh, oh, look at this. Yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> see this two years ago. It's like, nice. And then you get yeah. pride and satisfaction in the fact that, oh, cool. Yeah. This means that in those two years, I made this little increase, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that, that pride and satisfaction pales in comparison to the struggle and the disappointment from my point of view. I'm always trying to find that spot and always sort of think that I fall short. And I think that's a good thing because, you know, if you think, you know, like you say, if you think you nail it every time, you're not learning anything. But maybe I'm just being hard on myself. <laughs> Funny thing is that everybody's like that, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Even that's, if good. It, that's good to hear. Even yeah. if you don't, or at least everybody at a certain level. Yeah. You know, because like you say, it's funny. Uh, sometimes you don't know you don't know. Yeah, yeah. This friend of mine told me this thing, which he got stuck in my head, and he's so smart. I can't remember where he read it. And he was saying there are four stages of uh, learning, again. You know, so yeah. it's like, first is, you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. So let's say you're a fighter, right? Mm-hmm. You think, you don't know, you don't know. So you think, oh, yeah, I'm going to knock out that guy. But you don't know. Then you go there, you get your ass kicked, yeah. and now you know that you don't, you don't know. know. Yeah. <laughs> then you start training, yeah. and you become good. Now you know that you know. Yeah. And then when you master it, like you're a master, then you don't know that you know. Yeah. It's just second nature. 
Yeah. You know, and that in, in, in all level of, you know, fields of learning. So that's the thing. When you're in the stage, because I met people like this and, I, and I've been there as well when I was younger, you know, blessed by ignorance. So you don't know that you don't know. So you have some people, they think they know everything, but they just don't know. But then you have like people that do tattooing or whatever for their matter at certain level they all go through that process of struggle and focusing more on what you didn't do right or you could have done better mm. which it is being hard on yourself but at the same time it's just perfectionism and it's that little sparkle that makes you become better totally. otherwise if you'll be so satisfied you you'll yeah. be like yeah cool that's good enough you know? yeah yeah i don't ever want to be complacent on what i'm doing you know otherwise i shouldn't just sh shouldn't be doing it especially when it's art based there should be that sparkle as you say it's a hard struggle, you know what I mean? It's a hard struggle, but it's a bless. Oh, I, I enjoy it. I know, but that's early, like when I'm, when it's early hours in the morning and you're drawing or you're painting and you're just thinking, fuck, I need more time, you know? Yeah, I just think, fuck, what am I doing for a living? You know, look at what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, and it's just like. And it's beautiful because you can have that in any job, really, if you have yeah. the right kind of attitude, but or almost, but especially in this one. The bless is that you're doing a job, which is yeah. what pays the bills. But at the same time, it comes, the old package comes with this learning yeah. process through your life. Yeah. So it's something that it's incredible. To tell you the truth, man, you know what? I've done some jobs before I was tattooing that there was no way I could be passionate in. You know what I mean? And that, the fact that I, was, that I did these jobs kicked my ass to, to actually do something that I love to do. You know, I think people have to be put in positions where they're like, what the fuck am I doing to get out and do what they really want to do? You know, otherwise, you know, you're just wasting your life. Mm. You know, I don't know if you've done anything apart from tattooing. Everything. Everything. Like before tattooing, because I took that from my dad, which was a bit restless. So I changed over every minute. Yeah. So before tattooing, you name it, I did it. I yeah. did it all. Like all of it. Construction, yeah. supermarkets, like you name it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know. The good, <laughs> you know. The good thing is yeah. that, first of all, it's good because it gives you like flexibility yeah with things but then it's good because when you come to work every day you're like wait a second you remember when i was working construction getting up at five in the morning totally. and busting my ass off yeah that's why i see sometimes no not often but i met two or three young uh, kids whatever you know kids 22 yeah, whatever yeah. you know and well, they've never done any other job yeah you know so sometimes they get yeah, there's no perspective. There's yeah. no real real well, there's, perspective. There's, there isn't a lot of perspective at all over across the board i think you know what i mean a lot of a lot of younger tattooers don't really have that struggle. Obviously, it's you know, depending on what they're doing and, and, and what they're creating. But um, I don't know. It's the influences that are out there, out there is uh, totally different. So you're creating completely different mindsets. Sometimes you just can't, can't understand. You know what I mean? I'm just like, well, what the fuck is going on? Or what, what's happened to this industry? Or stuff like that. It's kind of eye-opening from, from seeing it how it was when I started to how it is now. It's... it's um, Sometimes it's hard to understand. There is a, a, a sort of a trend of tattooing that's sort of emerged that I, I can't, I can't understand. You know? Some stuff honestly just doesn't belong. It's no. simple and plain. Some stuff, mm. realistically, you know, there is, because tattooing has to keep going. So obviously there has to be a new generation, but there are those that fit. And yeah. Like, okay, you, you know, you are a tattooer. And then some people that honestly, they shouldn't exist. Yeah. Simple as that. You know, mm. they shouldn't make tattoos and some establishment or programs or whatever. They yeah, like some of the people that are starting tattooing now and doing tattoos and yeah. even getting tattoos if they did back then, they only got fucking eaten alive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just interesting, just the different S culture. Right? And then the different influences that they have, obviously with social media and with the TV shows like, you know, you know, the TV shows, I'm not going to yeah, mention yeah, any, yeah. but um, just the point of view or the, the perspective that that creates for either the tattooing, the tattooer or the, the general public is, I don't know, is creating a, a totally different culture, which I think is just not what I got into tattooing for, you know, it's a different thing. But um, again, it's the progression of our industry. And not only, as well, the, the social media that you mentioned, I think they influence the whole world, any industry, the yeah. food, the movie, the fashion, any industry, you know, and tattooing as well. Yeah. I like to call it digital narcissism, mm. you know, because it, it, it feeds on certain lower instinct, like yeah, radiation yeah. and stuff. So then it's not necessarily just tattooing, it's like everything, you yeah. know, because whatever job you do now, you have that model. So that obviously complicated things a little bit because mm. people get the wrong 
if you get into it now, you don't know how it was before, you don't know, you don't have any older friends that tell yeah. you, and then you get the wrong image, like, oh, that's how it's supposed to be. It's mm. me with 8,000 selfies and yeah, yeah. half titty out. And, you know, yeah, well, I just look at my kids and what, how they interact on social media and what's normal. You know what I mean? How old are your kids? Fuck? Uh, my oldest is 16, and, uh, 16 next month and my youngest is 13. So, so like full on. Just that's the, and that's the world now. You know, that, that online world, the social media is, is, is the world. You know, it's kind of, they, they do everything from um, just entertainment, watching stuff online to keeping in contact with their friends, obviously. But, you know, it's like when I was, when I was my oldest daughter's age, I was a fucking out. I was gone, you know, doing whatever I could away from home with my friends. Now there's, they can just sit around at home talking to their friends and hanging out online. That's kind of fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, get out of the house, man. Fuck, you know? My brother but, um, does the same. Yeah, but, you know, my oldest is really into drawing and she, she basically, she just took off leaps and bounds as soon as I gave her an iPad to draw on. And it's just kind of her generation to... I think it's the that's what inspires that generation is that type of medium, you know, that digital medium. You do you think she it. might be into tattooing? Yeah. Oh, I asked my kids, you know, I said, do you guys, you know, do you think you want to be a tattooer? You know, do you want to do you want to learn how to tattooing? And both of them said, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like and I said, fuck that. You can't say that. You yeah, just say I, yeah, yeah, man. You know, or like yeah, the, no, the, the, the you're not gonna just say like nah. You know, yeah, but the like, younger is what 12? Our youngest is 13, yeah, 13, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, maybe when she starts getting more around 17, yeah. 18, maybe. Well, that, and kind of that, that answer to me from my kids kind of shows me the general public attitude towards tattooing. It's like, oh, yeah, maybe, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like, fuck yeah, I want to get a yeah. tattoo. I'd rather it be, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to get a tattoo. I love them, you know, yeah. I've got to have them, or fuck off, you got a tattoo. What's wrong yeah. with you? I, I like that. I don't like this. You know what I mean? It's just kind of it's all or nothing. I got, my, I got my first tattoo when I was 13. Yeah. And me and my friend, we locked uh, ourselves in his bathroom and yeah. tattooed each other with, with you know, the sewing needle and shining. Of course. Like yeah, we all did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. because, oh, that's so cool. And then when I was 15, yeah. or at least for me, in Italy, there wasn't big tradition in tattooing like yeah. in the States or something. So all you could see tattoo-wise was hooligans with tribals. Totally. And I always found that thing so tough. Yeah. I was like, fuck, man. And I've never been a, a tough guy, like no, these no, no. guys, but yeah, I was yeah. like, that is so tough, that looks fucking yeah, yeah, sick, yeah. you know? And then you would see like, I don't know, man, Lorenzo Lamas or something on TV, you know, like, yeah, that's... The. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I did, you know, I went to some dude's house, you yeah. know, which apprenticed with Maurizio Ferri, like an old tattoo in Italy, which now passed, and, and got a tribal at his house yeah, at yeah. 15, and that was the toughest thing for me. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, so maybe it, yeah, start, it starts thing. young. I you was know? never doing, I didn't actually get any sort of just the homemade sort of needle and sort of, you know, pen ink. I did a few of my friends, you know, but nothing happened. What was your first tattoo? My first tattoo was a um, tattoo that I I got from College Hill back in the day. And it was a, because I was super into comic books, um, I was into this uh, artist, Jamie uh, Hewlett. I was more into the English artists than than American sort of superhero comics. I was more into like, like, you know, uh, 2000 AD and and those types of things. What kind of... Comics were they? Um, Two thousand eighty. Not 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 super, not superheroes. What was that? Not superheroes. Oh, and there's a few kind of. Um, it's more futuristic type stories, you know. Um, Judge Dredd. You know, you've heard. Oh of Judge yeah, Dredd okay, Judge Dredd. Yeah. Like and um, Nemesis and you know, Road Trooper and Slane mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so it was across the board from, um, you know, futuristic cities to um, sort of Scottish, sort of Gaelic fucking axe warriors. You know what I mean? From mm-hmm. with a lot of of that kind of ancient history in it. So there was across the board kind of shit, but it was um, it was made in England, you know? It's just kind of a little bit more, this is a little bit more identifiable down here in New Zealand and, you know, being a British colony and all that sort of shit. But um, I liked that kind of imagery. Like so what? that's the first thing that I got. Actually, I got a, a tank girl tattoo, and um, which is covered up now, because it just got in the way of everything. And, um, after that, I just got a big tribal Celtic thing, you know, because that was the era. That was makes the sense, yeah. From there, I got different things all over me, you know what I mean? From writing to um, to tribal to, like, attempts at Japanese mm-hmm. to graffiti, just things like that. Yeah, you know, like just the that era. Yeah. You know what I mean? Change. Like just those influences and, 
in what you're looking at and the culture that you're in. And uh, do you travel a lot, or have you? I do. Traveling? I do these days, and I didn't. I, um, I didn't travel a lot when I was younger. I was just basically just focusing on trying to tattoo, trying to do as much tattooing as I could, stay in one place, and sort of build up a clientele. Um, I travelled a lot when I was younger before I was tattooing, and I would would go to America and would buy a van and would on a couple of occasions we just drove across from one one coast to the other just traveling around meeting people and going to hardcore shows from there after my the second time i went and did that i actually started tattooing and then from that point it became more of a tattoo sort of trip than a just going on to see bands so tattooing and bands to all you know and um first time i really went traveling for tattooing or just see tattooing was the early 2000s went to the Tokyo Tattoo Show and just saw some fucking killers just doing what they do. Why Tokyo specifically? Um, and not states or whatever. Because of that tattoo show. And because of the caliber of the artists that were there. And, you know, it's just one of those ones that this is the one I chose. I'm stoked I chose it. First time in Japan, right? First time in Japan, yeah. What was the... Because I guess you land there and your mind was like... <sighs> yeah, it's fucking, it was amazing. I was just keen to get to the show, keen to see these tattoos. And you know, I, I got to the show and I didn't even realise that you had to buy a ticket to get into the show. So I turned up to the show, it was me and my wife Ainsley, and we were there in line and they were like, okay, where's your ticket? I was like, I don't fucking have a ticket. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't have a ticket, you know? And they were like, oh, you can't get in without a ticket. And I was like, oh, fuck. And I had a friend over there who was from Australia, who's Canadian, actually, Tim Dewaska. And uh, he, he was like, oh, man, you got to have a ticket, you know. And there's another guy who's friends with um, William Yoniyama was there, and he, I'm pretty sure it was him, he hooked it up and we got him. Because so you couldn't buy it, it on the spot? I don't yeah. think you can buy it on the door. I think it was pre-sales. Oh, and, right. and I was, from what I got, from, you know, and uh, I was like, oh, fuck. Classic, you know, get all the way to Japan, get to the fucking Tokyo Tattoo Show, and not get in. Then <laughs> <laughs> there would be a story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just standing around outside. It's just yeah. But we got in, and what really stood out was just just the, the tattoo. Philip Lou tattooing all day with a crowd of people, three sixty around him. You know, just sort of stand. You know how you have people behind the barriers, you know, behind their desk. People three sixty around him. It was crazy just seeing, watching him that close, tattooing all day. Was it the first time you would get close to meet, see Philip Liu? That was the first time, yeah, mm. yeah. You know, like, I'm no good at meeting and communicating with people that I'm really, really inspired by. Fucking just fall to bits. I'd rather not than go up and go, hey, I'm your, you know, I yeah, fucking yeah. love your shit. I just, uh, just can't do that. It was cool just sit, standing back and watching him do his thing. What, 2000? So I'd been tattooing about eight years at that point. After eight years, never really seen any tattooing like that being done. That's yeah, especially kind of, because, like because, you say, like because you come from down, come down here, yeah. And yeah. it's just like, whoa, shit, look at that, you know? And what's your favorite like, spots that you've been? Favorite spots? I really like Paris. I don't know why I like Paris. It's like the, the age. I like old cities, you know, mm -hmm. New Zealand, Auckland, in, in relation to our modern society. It's fucking not old at all. It's not as, we don't have the culture or the age of the culture like Europe does. Obviously, we have an amazing Māori culture, and it's fucking so original and so rad and so I iconic to this part of the world. But it's when different. It comes to, yeah, culture. but it's different. I loved Italy. I really like Venice. Venice is so beautiful. Man. It's amazing. And, and, you know, again, it's totally different from here. You know, you go there and you, it's, it's just insanity. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of similarities to New Zealand when it comes to England, but it's um, when, it come, when it comes to big cities. I love New York, you know. It's just a big city thing, I think, that really attracts me. I go to LA quite a lot. I'm a huge fan of LA, just because of how spread out it is, and it's not an easy city to get around unless you have a car. Right? Car, yeah. But um, there's these little pockets of LA, which are fucking amazing. When we were in LA, we stayed in or California. We stayed in Newport Beach. You ever been to Newport Beach? Mm. It's fucking, it's quite cool. It's quite nice. I wouldn't want to live there, but I stayed there for a, for a week. It was fucking rad. I like places like Rarotonga. Have you been to Rarotonga? Rara? Rarotonga? It's, Rara a, it's a Pacific island. Cook no. Islands? No. Yeah, I, I like places like that. Is it like the way I imagine it? Like a beautiful pa beaches. paradise kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I guess you need, I mean, like everything, you need balance, yeah. you know? Then you come back and you're super inspired and then... Oh, yeah. Inspiration is, is the key for traveling for me. I don't, I don't do it for anything else. Mm. 
but when you go to places like Rotonga, you go there to relax with your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Get in the water. Yeah, yeah. yeah the other job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, fa- the, dead, the dead job. Yeah. And when it comes to, like, you know, drawing, painting, you know, what's your creative process? Um, I'll flip through my books, man. You know, I'll just pull, pull out books. Every time I pull out a book, I notice something new. It's funny because, like, the book is still the same, but you change. Yeah. So that picture, it looks you, different. It inspires you in a different One way. year later. And, yeah. and like you say, you see things yeah. that before you didn't. Yeah. Or you're more in sync toward noticing. You'll see a flower in a totally different way. Mm-hmm. Or something that might have been a little too basic for you to notice previously is now exactly what you're looking at, you know. That's usually what I get inspired. You know, maybe listen to some music. Maybe watching an old 80s horror movie. Yeah? Yeah. You like that stuff? <laughs> yeah, I love it. I watched this recently. This I've never seen it. I was in Zurich. A mayor BM is I want to watch, watch tonight. And I saw this thing, which I can't remember what it's called. It's this movie with this old wrestler from the 90s. The movie, I think, is from the 90s. And with this old wrestler with longer hair. And basically the story is that he can put these glasses on and he can see people for what they really are. Yeah, that's They Live. That's um, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Dude, they Live, yeah. That movie's so it's a good. Classic. I never seen it. I was like, John, how have I never seen this? John Carpenter. <sighs> yeah, he, does, he's, he did a remake of an old film called The Thing, which is one of my favorite movies. Have you seen The Thing? The Thing with Donald Cut Russell? Kurt Russell, yeah. yeah. You, 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 I've seen the original. Yeah. The, the one with Cut Russell. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 there's a one before that. Okay. So, so, um, uh, so the Cut Russell is the remake? Is in, yeah, is John Carpenter's version of okay. the original. How is the, the previous one? John Carpenter's the one, it's the man. It's, yeah, the one. Yeah, yeah. it's just cool, everything about it. You know, it's sci-fi, a bit, bit of alien shit in there, it's got some, some suspense, it's got gore, it's got crazy effects, you know, it's just some scenes in there are just so good. You know, even though that some of the effects have dated a little bit, it kind of just makes it rad. But it's cool, you know why? Yeah. It, it, what I find myself, at least, and I know nothing about movies, but what I like is that they, even not just with horror movies, but with these old movies, they were so good at creating the atmosphere without so many tools yeah because now sometimes they rely on special yeah, effects so the music polished. is lame you know i see that yeah. kind of like with how ipads is in tattling now which is kind of like helps people polish their drawings a little mm-hmm. too much mm-hmm. it's like man that's cgi in in horror movies it's kind of like the ipad is creating an easy version to just change and change and change until it's become Perfect. sterile you know what i mean mm. but yeah i love that kind of 80s horror and craziness you know these days I'm more into the darker if, when it comes to modern horrors darker sort of suspenseful occult type movies you know like you know The Witch and I really like that movie Under the Skin which is Scarlett Johansson in it she's like a what is it about? Uh, it's about aliens that are harvesting human bodies oh, <laughs> you right. don't really know why but yeah. they're, they're, she's out there luring men into this old house that really becomes this void where they get sort of trapped in in, in this liquid and they just get fucking their body becomes harvested is it a new movie? Nah, I'd more? say oh shit man I'd say probably between 5 and 10 years old now oh ah, okay no, no. definitely see it okay yeah I, I think it's fucking awesome it's dark as fuck you know it's not yeah. it's not for everyone and it's not it's not that bad I don't think it's bad you know but, you know, I told a customer to see it once, and he came in and he goes, why the fuck did you tell me to watch that movie? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> you didn't like it? Why did yeah, you like I, it? I don't know. Maybe it's just because it's slow Too and dark? not a lot happens, and it's not not super flashy. It's not like a you know, superhero movie. It's not even got effects or anything. It's, it's not just, Stranger Things. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. I think it's probably one of the best movies that Scarlet's, Scarlet, Scarlet's mm-hmm. done. You need to be into that stuff, otherwise. Yeah, yeah, and you, you, you need to like a slow burner. You know, there's not a lot of dialogue, and it's it's just that I think it's really a collection of amazing visuals with this kind of crazy sci-fi. Have you seen the Nicolas Cage Mandy? I fucking love that movie. Oh, so good. I love it. The I picture was, and the music. Are I was kind so of good. I went off the boil with Nicolas Cage like years and years ago. I was like, the fucking. You know, the movies he's doing. Same thing. When you see Nicolas Cage, it's like, uh, yeah, no. yeah, it's like, oh, I don't know if I watch it. But then I watched that, and I fucking loved it. I was like, oh my god, he's he's back. It's so good. Yeah. They're sitting in the bathroom, it's epic. Oh, it's dude, so I read this. I mean, epic. I love all that sort of hor- What is it? The, well, you know, and this is crazy acid sort of induced bikers turn up. You know <laughs> yeah, I mean? yeah, 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 yeah. 
just the perception you get through this crazy fucking acid that they're taking you is amazing. Yeah, it's so it's super dark. That's when dark, but it's house, not as well. You their know, their house is dark as fuck. Yeah, yeah. So, I just yeah. love the vibe. You know that weird and that Mandy, just fucking super weird. You know, and and that the weird cult. Is so beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing. I just love the, the, that director and his little black metal fucking sort of fantasy art sort of cuts. Yeah, it's almost like clever. yeah, it was like space fantasy yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and you know if you if you would think about something that over all these years, right? Uh-huh. You either you learn or an advice that somebody gave you or somebody that you figure out yourself or you know through experience whatever, and you keep going back to it and like oh man that thing really got stuck with me and helped me through many times. You know, I really remember that lesson I learned or that tips they gave me. What would that be? Hmm. That's a real, that's a hard question. I think one of the one of the major things that I was taught, and this was by my father, before you know, this is when I was a kid, and I wasn't even thinking about talent. But he was like, never sit around and do fucking nothing. Always in a work situation. You know what I mean? If you've got nothing to do, find something to do. And I think he really instilled a strong work ethic in me. And I think that is what is my main influence just having that m- mindset just like always thinking about um not so much always thinking about work but always thinking when it comes to art you know it's not it's not work you want to do it um it's, it's just like um having a work ethic in relation to everything how you approach things. yeah how you approach it and if you if you're doing it you're doing it you know what i mean it's not like uh probably sounds like i'm i'm a workaholic but i probably am i don't know I told you, some yeah. levels, you know, these, like we all are, yeah. you know, when you reach to a certain level, because yeah. the, the line between work and, and passion and slash addiction, yeah. it's blurry. It's like, you know, when people say, oh, what do you, what do, you do when you're not working? And I was like, I'm oh, fucking drawing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, that's yeah. what I want to do. On painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's my hobby. And I'm lucky that my hobby and what I'm super interested in, interested in is my job. Hopefully there's people everywhere that, that have got that same thing and that's really hard to find it's really hard to actually um do art and make a living out of it so we're super super lucky yeah. to do what we do and you couldn't do or achieve certain things if you wouldn't have that that work ethic type of yeah. obsession obsession yeah Otherwise. yeah i suppose you could call it that you know like i think it may have started out with my dad going don't don't waste your time if you're going to do the job do it properly and put and if you don't if you finish that job find another job to do and i think that's become that work ethic that has become an obsession. Mm. So it's not work anymore. It's a necessity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if you What about you? Is there anything in you? Is there any, anything that is Man, same, out? same thing. I would yeah. definitely have to think about, but there are... Yeah, there, there are a few key moments, you know, that, that really... They really get stuck and and one thing is learning respect for example mm-hmm. you know for people yeah. and the way to approach people uh, it, it's, it's funny because there's like few bits and pieces that sometimes bubble up you know like one friend from germany andreas conan he he said this pretty recently about same thing he got stuck with me he said something about japanese people that when they talk you know they think about the other person first mm-hmm. so they really think before talking mm. so they're not gonna put you in a bad position of have to call me out of my bullshit yeah you know and make you uncomfortable so yeah. i'm like wait a second yeah. Is this question worth? You know, that's one thing. Yeah, yeah. Very fond of Stoic uh, philosophy. Yeah. So it's really a lot about, you know, resilience and, and men being in control of your emotions, you know. Yeah. So be aware of where things are coming from that you are saying or doing. So, you know, filter it. Mm. Yeah, definitely a few, few bits in there. I yeah. would have to think about it. And if you, if you could somehow give an advice to yourself when you were like 18 what would you tell yourself with what you know now and be like damn you know what um be brave just uh, it's I don't know I know we've talked quite a lot about not being 100% sure I'm not 100% happy with 100% of your work 100% of the time you know what I mean it's kind of like but in saying that you sort of have to be brave and just get out there and do it you know like it comes back to me saying i can't talk to people that i i have a lot of respect for in the industry because it's so hard for me to to break the ice 
because I'm a bumbling idiot, basically. Um, but, you know, from an early point, if I was like, man, I've just got to fucking do it, I've got to be brave, we've got to, you know, I've just got to just get out there and make that connection, I think that would have, would have opened a few more doors, would have met a few more people earlier on, you know, probably would have travelled with tattooing a lot more earlier on. But, um, dare a bit more. Dare a bit more, yeah, yeah. And when it, in, in relation to meeting and talking to people and in, re- in relation to art and what you create, you know, sometimes just fucking do something, push the boundaries, you know. Awesome. But, yeah. Dean, thank you very much for oh, having thanks. me at Sacred and no, no for making time for this chat. Yeah, it was it's good always nice you. to see you once a year. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully yeah, totally. this, time, this oh. time in London, hopefully yeah, I'll totally I see you. see you in London, man, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's going to be soon anyway. Yeah, yeah, it will be. Awesome. Cool. And good luck with your other project that we're not going to mention, that we were talking about before. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, really I don't know, we'll see how that goes. How um, that goes. Yeah, it, like, it, yeah. Again, it's something I've got to throw in the mix. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it requires me talking to people quite a lot. So um, I'll, I'll see how it goes. You know, there's a few, a few other people that are really psyched to get that going and um, that are on the same wavelength with that type of, um, with that type of, I don't know, subject, you know? Mm-hmm. And that goes hand in hand with like that kind of crazy occult, supernatural horror movie thing that I like, you know? Um, but we'll see how it happens. It might happen, it might not. The obstacle is there. Yeah, way. yeah, the obstacle. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to get way. into the... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dean, awesome. thank you very much. Awesome, man. Hi, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it. I'm really happy that I made this year to interview Dean, a legend down here. And soon there's going to be another tattoo legend from New Zealand. So stay tuned for a new episode coming out soon. In the meanwhile, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, Tattoo Tales Podcast. And you can follow us on Instagram, Tattoo Tales Podcast. And keep an eye out for my new project. I'm working on a new book, which will be published this summer. 33 A2 size paintings will be exhibited at the London Tattoo Convention. End of July, start of August. All news on my personal page, Steph Bastian, or on my website, stephbastian.com. Thank you for listening and see you soon.